Hello, and welcome to A Health Podacy. I'm your host, Alan Weil. Finding access to mental health services can be challenging in the United States for a variety of reasons. The explosion of demand for services, an inadequate workforce to provide them, and payment levels and methods that don't always support the care people need. There are also longstanding concerns regarding the access to all types of care for people enrolled in Medicaid, primarily due to low payment rates for services. If you put those together, it's not surprising that access to mental health services for people on Medicaid poses particular challenges. And since Medicaid is the largest payer for mental health services and treatment in the United States, these are challenges that need to be addressed. Access to mental health services for Medicaid enrollees is the topic of today's episode of A Health Podacy. I'm here with Jane Zhu, Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Zhu and co-authors published a paper in the July 2022 issue of Health Affairs assessing the prevalence of what they called phantom providers in Oregon Medicaid managed care networks. These are providers who are listed but not really providing very many services. They found that a large share of mental health providers listed in these network directories saw four or fewer Medicaid patients, and the shares were largest for specialists and people authorized to prescribe medication. We'll talk about this and more in today's episode. Dr. Zhu, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to our conversation about access to mental health services We're focusing here on Oregon, and we're focusing on managed care organizations, CCOs, coordinated care organizations. So before we get into the data, can you just explain what are these provider directories? What, what, who's in them? Who uses them? Why do they exist? So provider directories are basically lists of all the healthcare professionals that insurance companies or health plans contract with and um, therefore consider in network. And they're used for a number of purposes. Um, So health plans and insurance regulators often use provider directories to monitor the adequacy of a network or um, in essence, if a network provides sufficient access to care. Um, And consumers also use provider directories to make healthcare decisions. Um, For example, they're finding doctors that accept their insurance, for finding doctors that are in their area and close by. Um, And in some cases, uh, consumers use provider directories to decide which health plan to enroll in. Uh, So for example, if you have a specific health condition or you see a specific specific doctor, uh, you may want to make sure that your health plan covers these services or that these particular individuals are in network for your plan. So these directories are important for patients and they're important for regulators. You looked at the directories for CCOs. Now, probably most of our listeners are familiar with managed care organizations, HMOs. The CCO term is specific to the Oregon Medicaid program. Can you tell me a little bit more about what a CCO is and how it is similar and maybe different from the managed care entities people are more familiar with. Sure. I'm sure your listeners know, Alan, that most uh, Medicaid enrollees are now part of Medicaid managed care plans. Uh, And the CCO in Oregon is essentially a version of that. So CCO stands for Coordinated Care Organization, uh, which is a local network of providers that provide Medicaid enrollees with physical health, behavioral health, dental care services. Um, Back in 2012, Oregon reorganized its Medicaid program and established these CCOs to provide really comprehensive integrated care for the Medicaid population here. Um, And they're locally governed. They're accountable for performance-based metrics and quality. And so uh, in some ways, they're like a blend of Medicaid managed care organizations and accountable care organizations. I would say that the biggest difference uh, compared to other Medicaid managed care uh, organizations in other states is that uh, in CCO, CCOs actually accept full financial risk. So instead of getting a per capita payment from the state to cover, uh, say, a group of Medicaid members, CCO accept full financial risk for their population in the form of a global budget. But for all intents and purposes, I would think of them like any other Medicaid 
managed care organization. It's just a different version of that. And there's one other dimension that might be of interest because you mentioned at the outset uh, that uh, people can use the provider directories to select plans. But if I understand correctly, the CCOs in Oregon are geographically, uh, uh, there, there's one per area. Sorry, I, I should have a good word for that. Uh, they're geographically distinct. So actually, if you where you live determines which CCO you're in and you can't pick among them. Is that, is that right? That's right. So uh, in Oregon's Medicaid program, the CCOs are what we like to say regionally organized or locally organized. Um, and so they're definitely distributed in a particular geographic manner. And so in this particular program, um, enrollees don't necessarily have a choice in terms of who what plan they're enrolling in. But I would, I'd have to add that in Medicaid, um, probably these provider directories may be even more important for a few additional reasons. Um, for one, there's good evidence to suggest that Medicaid participation is lower, as you mentioned in the outset of the program, especially amongst um, specialists and even more so amongst mental health specialists. So Medicaid enrollees need to find a way uh, to uh, access providers that will accept their insurance and are available for care. And, and these numbers are, you know, few and far between to start with. And then the second reason I think these provider directories are important for Medicaid beneficiaries, even if they don't have the ability to select their own plans, is that um, for many reasons, including cost of care and the way that the program is administered, uh, Medicaid beneficiaries most often don't have the ability to access care out of network like others in, uh, you know, com with the commercial coverage might be able to. Okay, so we've set the stage very nicely regarding the importance of these directories, but let's start getting into the data. You looked at whether or not people who are listed as providers in these directories were actually providing care. Uh, we're not going to go through all the methods in the paper, but why don't you at least explain the overall approach you took to try to differentiate between whether someone's there on paper and whether they're there in reality. Our analysis was focused on, as you mentioned, mental health delivery. Uh, and so we focus on a broad swath of providers that deliver mental health services, uh, including primary care providers like myself, mental health prescribing uh, providers like psychiatrists and mental health nurse practitioners, and then non-prescribing mental health specialists, uh, which include therapists, psychologists, counselors, social workers. They actually deliver a lot of mental health services to this population. Um, and then we compared listings of providers in CCO directories to those in administrative claims data. The, the way that we, we defined a provider to be in-network in the claims data was if they were associated with any medical claims, not just mental health claims, filed for at least five unique Medicaid beneficiaries enrolled in a particular CCO during the study period. And so in comparing these listings of providers in directories to empirically constructed network uh, level claims data, we found that overall... 58% of all providers who deliver mental health care saw few or no Medicaid patients at all over the study period. And that this discrepancy was highest amongst uh, mental health prescribers. So amongst that particular group of providers, approximately two-thirds of those listed in provider directories saw few or no Medicaid patients in our study period. Okay, so I just want to pause here before we take these data apart. What you're telling me is that if I'm enrolled in Medicaid uh, in Oregon and I need some mental health services and I pull out the directory, that on average about half the time someone's name I find in there is someone who sees basically no Medicaid, maybe one or two, has one or two claims. And that for as and we'll go more into depth here for some of the other categories, but the numbers can go up above that for for some uh, particular needs I might have. So these, I mean, this is just a huge gap between what I think I'm going to have access to and and what I really have access to. Is is that? Am I reading the data right here? Right, that's correct. So I mean, that's the main I think takeaway uh, for me at least. It was that this is a really large number of providers who are um, not actually seeing Medicaid patients, uh, you know, in our in in the claims data. And conversely, if you you sort of flip the result on its head, what this is suggesting is that 
only a third, uh, approximately a third of mental health prescribers, for example, are actually seeing patients, uh, you know, more than five uh, uh, patients in a given year. And uh, this, con- so, so I think I'm glad you mentioned that, that there's sort of two sides to the coin. One is that there are some people seeing almost no one, but the other side is that there's some people seeing a whole lot of folks. And are those, does that make up for the problem? Do you say, well, it's okay that we're missing half of the providers because these other folks can pick up the slack? Is that, would that be a reasonable conclusion? It's a really interesting question. I think a little bit out of the scope of our analysis because we weren't able to you know, provide definitive information as to, you know, what the impact of those larger uh, patient panels might be on, uh, on, on providers. But in our analysis, we did calculate a measure which we called realized access. And essentially, that's the ratio of in-network providers by claims data to total providers reported in the directory data. And what we found was that CCOs, networks of mental health prescribers, had lower realized access and larger panel sizes than networks of mental health non-prescribers and primary care providers. So what we're suggesting here is that, for sure, mental health prescribers are apparently seeing fewer mental uh, Medicaid patients, but they're also having much larger panel sizes and seeing more patients um, when they are seeing uh, Medicaid patients. So the ultimate impact of that burden on issues like you know, workplace burden and 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 uh, retention and attrition amongst providers is less known and is probably outside the scope of this this uh, analysis, but definitely related and very important to to study. Well, I want to get into some of the differences across provider type and CCO. Uh, we'll dive into that after we take a short break. And we're back. I'm speaking with Dr. Jane Zhu about what are called phantom networks, the fact that there are people listed on a provider directory uh, who aren't really providing any care or not very much of it. These data come from Oregon, but the story uh, is certainly one that needs to be understood around the country. Before the break, we went to sort of the high-level findings about the large share of providers who, who really aren't delivering much care. But uh, you did note, Dr. Zhu, some variation across uh, provider type. And for those who aren't closely uh, aware of the, the different roles that different providers play, can you say a little bit more about prescribers, a little bit more about primary care versus specialty, and, um, and how your findings vary across those? And then Maybe we can also talk a little bit about the differences across the CCOs, because there are, what, about 15 of them in Oregon, and they don't all have the same results here. Uh, I'm a primary care physician myself, and what I've sort of become over time is essentially a de facto mental health provider. Uh, I am trained and very comfortable providing care to people with mental health conditions um, uh, that are moderate or less severe, but for people with more severe mental health conditions, severe mental illness, I manage those conditions alongside, you know, mental health specialty providers like uh, psychiatrists and uh, uh, therapists and and other ancillary support. Uh, And so there are, the way that I think about mental health services provision in this country is that, you know, primary care providers typically represent sort of the foundation of a lot of general care. We do take care of mental health conditions, but we often do that in conjunction with our specialty colleagues. And then um, in terms of, you know, prescriptions, um, there's, that's often provided by psychiatrists and mental health nurse practitioners who have licenses and are able to prescribe medications. And typically for those with severe mental illness, they manage antipsychotics and other, you know, antidepressants and other um, more complicated medication uh, regimens. And then uh, a really important part of mental health service delivery is 
uh, counseling and therapy and supportive uh, services. And that's often provided by non-prescribing providers like therapists, behavioral health specialists, social workers, psychologists, and, and counselors. Well, that was very helpful. And uh, now let's overlay the data because you did have somewhat different rates of availability or, or actual provision of service across those. So help me understand the implications of someone, for example, who has difficulty finding a prescriber, even though maybe they can find a counselor. Presumably that, that could have a real effect on people's care. Yeah, I mean, you would imagine that we would see a lot more variation across pr- uh, provider types than we actually did. So I think the the top line message here is that mental health prescribers often had the least number of pr- pr- proportions of of pro- providers that were actually seeing Medicaid patients. But you know, ment- for mental health non prescribing specialists, uh, those numbers were were not far behind, um, and generally. Um, for these mental health specialists, uh, access was lower than for primary care physicians or uh, and other providers. Um, so not necessarily out of line for, with what we would expect. Um, that being said, we did find that there were some differences in terms of the patterns of care delivery across provider types. For example, um, the uh, uh, panel size for mental health prescribers, as I mentioned before, were typically larger uh, than for mental health non-prescribers. Um, and what we typically saw was that, um, you know, providers, um, provider to enrollee ratios, which were essentially calc- are often used as a measure of network adequacy. Uh, were lowest for mental health prescribers and highest for primary care providers. Um, And so uh, there is some variation across provider types, but in our study, the the main finding around these phantom providers networks, uh, the differential was not as high as I would expect. Another dimension of variation is CCO by CCO. Since they have geographic regions, uh, there are some more urban parts of the state, there are some very rural parts of the state. Anything you can say about the variation across CCOs, or is this a phenomenon that's basically present in all of them? Yeah, there was wide variation that we saw um, across CCOs in the degree to which their provider directories reflected access care in the claims data. And, you know, there's probably some justifiable reasons for variation across CCOs in terms of the numbers of providers and the composition of their provider networks based on rural urban geographies and supplies uh, that are inherent to those geographies of provider types. Um, But there's not a really good reason that I can think of that explains why the differences or the discrepancies between provider directories and accessed care might vary across um, geographies. And so it may be that there are um, potentially, you know, uh, inherent with CCOs, different administrative capacities um, and and abilities to keep up with provider directory upkeep um, that might explain some of these differences uh, but but um, those are things that you know are, are raise more questions than than are answered in our study right this does raise questions and you know you could imagine that this is sort of a source of frustration uh, certainly as a patient you're going through directory trying to find someone and it you get it, it it gets old calling numbers and finding out people aren't taking uh, new patients. Uh, that's a frustration probably many people have had, whether they're on Medicaid or any other type of insurance. Um, but beyond the frustration, what are the concerns that come to you based on these findings? And and what do you hope uh, policymakers will do about maybe not just this one study, but this one in conjunction with others that that gives some insight into the gap between uh, what's listed in these directories and what care is actually available. Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a primary care physician. And so I think I, I see these 
findings of our analyses played out in real time often. When I refer a patient to psychiatry or to counseling um, because they have really severe mental illness or um, conditions that I can't manage personally, they come back to me repeatedly uh, because they're unable to find a provider who's willing and able to see them. And I refer them to provider directories all the time. Um, and uh, the inaccuracies uh, really play out in terms of delays, interruptions in care, foregone care. And those barriers can have lots of important clinical implications um, for people with mental health conditions. So the primary concern I think raised by our findings is around the accuracy of provider directories. Um, there's been tons of studies that have relied on audits and secret shopper approaches that have found provider directories to contain lots of inaccuracies around contact information. So non-working telephone numbers, wrong addresses, uh, et cetera. Uh, but when we traditionally have talked about the accuracy of provider directories, we typically haven't included a definition that includes uh, who in these directories are actually seeing patients. And the fact that we found so many of providers listed in directories to be seeing so few patients um, is concerning, I think, for regulators who are relying on this information to um, assess network adequacy. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, you know, certainly concerning for patients. I would say that potentially a second concern that our findings raise is that a small set of providers seem to be delivering most of the care in Medicaid. And this is something that you alluded to earlier, Alan. I think these findings are in particularly consistent with a, a recent pub, a study that was published in Health Affairs um, by Luda Mirsky and co-authors co um, that our study follows. Um, this point is I think important because Medicaid has a really hard time getting specialists to participate in health plans. Um, providers experience large or high turnover or churn, and yet demand for services is growing. And so the implications here is that if one provider has a large panel of Medicaid patients and they burn out and decide to leave, uh, this likely has really important implications for, for care continuity and delivery. So I think when you talk about policy implications, you know, following from, from, from what I just discussed, I think there's a few. Um, just to dive right in, I think that network adequacy is, is, and the ways to regulate and monitor that comes up as a big topic. I think in general, network adequacy seems like a pretty intuitive concept. Essentially, we want people to be able to get the care they need when they need it. But in reality, it's been really nebulous and different, difficult to operationalize. And um, lots of state Medicaid programs are all trying to come up with their own standards and ways to monitor this. So the first, I think, policy implication is that because um, relying on provider directories, at least in their current form, has potential shortcomings that we're finding in our analysis, it may be preferable to use potentially a combination of data and methods, including claims data, to, to really come up with meaningful metrics around uh, what constitutes an adequate network. Um, and then I think the second implication is that health plans should be mo doing more to ensure that their provider directories are accurate. And this one is really challenging, I, I think, because providers often move, they change affiliations, uh, they take breaks, they have, you know, maternity leaves and sabbaticals. Um, and keeping up with this constant change represents a pretty large administrative burden on the part of um health plans. And then as we found in our analysis, most providers actually contract with multiple health plans. And so for providers to answer health plans directory requests also constitutes a huge, a huge burden. And so what is needed likely is better enforcement along with an ease um, of administrative and reporting burdens in order to address this much larger issue. Well, I appreciate the comprehensive uh, reflection on the policy implications. And one of the things I've liked about this conversation and reading your paper is that it's clearly shaped 
by your own experience as a clinician. And we really do need to approach these policy matters, uh, not just with a look at the data, but a look at, at uh, how how care is actually delivered and who's delivering it and the barriers uh, clinicians and patients run into in trying to deliver good care. All of that makes its way into this paper and makes it enjoyable to have a conversation with you. Dr. Zhu, thank you for uh, uh, the work you've done here, your focus on such a critical topic, and for being my guest today on A Health Policy. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll tell a friend about a health policy. Health Policy is produced by Health Affairs, the leading journal for health policy research. The team behind the show includes Patty Sweet, Jeff Byers, Julia Vivolo, Sarah Kolk, and Sue Ducat. Like the show? Subscribe to A Health Policy on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thanks for listening and have a great morning, day, or evening.